few uh, minor points of housekeeping. Um, so first of all, uh, just say uh, welcome everybody. My name is Neil Kermode. Um, I'm the secretary of the Orkney Heritage Society and I'm also the acting chair of the John Ray Society uh, at the moment. So this is a good opportunity to bring uh, those two groups together and we have so many members of the um, Heritage Society and also John Ray Society, members of the, Orch the Archaeology Society, that this was just too good an opportunity not to bring um, so many like-minded people as close together as we can manage on the on this rather now stormy day as we got here in Stennis at the moment. Um, we're going to uh, run through the presentations in a few minutes, but could I just ask a, a couple of uh, little bits of housekeeping? Um, first of all, would you mind keeping your mics muted um, unless we ask you to uh, uh, ask a question or something or want to bring you in? Um, uh, we are going to be recording this meeting so that we've got it for reference later on and for a record later on because we're sure the contents of the talks we're about to hear are going to be interesting enough for people to want to see them at a later date as well. Um, if you do have any questions about either of the presentations, then please do type them in the chat function, um, which I expect after a year of doing this, for goodness sake, how, how the hell did that happen? Um, we're now probably getting quite familiar with the use of the chat function, but if you're not sure, um, down at the bottom of the screen, um, in the more section at the bottom, there is the opportunity uh, to, to click on that as it's chat. And if you are, type any questions you've got in there, either Julie or Haley, we'll be keeping an eye on that and we can then pose those questions to the speak as, as we go. So I hope that all makes sense. If somebody has got a problem, um, um, feel free to wave frantically at the camera if you want to. Um, if you want to turn your cameras off, then you can do, although I must admit when I'm speaking, it's useful at least if some people have cameras on rather than I just feel I'm talking to myself in my own kitchen. Um, so it does give the sense of an audience, yeah. so that would be useful. So um, I'm going to introduce the, the, the two speakers. Um, uh, Sandra will be speaking second. Uh, Sandra is the project manager for uh, John Ray Society and will fully introduce herself, but her job has been very much to pull together the money uh, to make this project with the Clestrain Hall um, a reality. And first up is going to be um, Andrew Appleby, who uh, probably needs little or no introduction from anybody, so I'm not even going to bother. Yeah. Um, probably too. Um, and Andrew's uh, going to give a little introduction about the society and then into the archaeology of what's been going on. So if everybody's happy, strap in. Here we go. Andrew, you have control. OK. Uh, can I get my presentation up? Can we get the presentation? Ah, here we go. Right. Um, can we go to the first slide, please? Uh, no, no, no. Um, backwards, go backwards. Backwards. Another one, backwards. That's it. Right. Now, um, First, before I do an introduction, I just wish to pay a tribute to Ivan Craigie, who sold us the uh, Hall of Cleston and his wife, Jean. Ivan, as you probably know, died suddenly earlier this year. Um, but I just felt that I wanted to mention him first because his name will probably crop up a couple of times. And uh, so uh, I just want to just pay a tribute that he was a great supporter of us and, and we miss him greatly. So I mentioned the purchase of the Hall of Clestron. Um, this we achieved uh, two or three years ago and um, we, 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 we had no money and we um, asked to buy it and we said we'll find the money and it was agreed, we agreed a price and we agreed terms which were very good and so we went ahead and directly we knew we were going to purchase it. Um, our, our scheme was that we would restore the hall and create um, an Arctic centre in the name and memory of John Ray uh, but this wouldn't all be all about John Ray, it would involve pan-Arctic subjects um, the, the peoples there, the nature, global warming, the geology, the Arctic Rim, and, and we Orkney is classed as part of the Arctic Circle by the peoples in the Arctic, so it's very relevant, and this could well be um, gateway to the Arctic, which 
uh, of course, Stromness actually was. Um, so there we are. That Sandra will continue and broaden on the scheme. So now I want to familiarize you with the hall itself. It was built, so we've been, it's built, so it's been recorded, finished in 1769. And that's an interesting date. It was meant originally to have a pediment here, uh, which was blown away uh, in the late 1700s. Uh, there's this four stair here, which is very grand. Uh, the, the cheek walls here replaced uh, iron, um, uh, iron um, banisters. Here is the east wing, which is no longer. It was destroyed, it was, it was demolished in 1953. Uh, there were windows in the upper story. Now this is taller than later photographs. It was reduced in height. Uh, and the angle of the roof um, slackened. Now, notice there's this dark wall going along the front here. That is a, a wall which encloses what we call the moat. But this is only a retaining wall. It was put there because the moat was originally a lot wider and it was probably had a 45 degree angle going down to a drainage system. And <clears throat> that would have given far more light into the lower stories all the way around. Now, the, this, this wall goes around three sides of the Hall of Clestrum. And so we're looking at this, and but when John Ray lived there, it was quite different because he was born in 1813 in the house and lived there <coughs> until he went to Edinburgh to the university. And then uh, shortly after that, he was off to the Hudson Bay um, as a ship surgeon, as we know. So we've got a date of 1769 that this was built. Can I have the next slide? <coughs> Here we have a favorite of Neil's, Murdo Mackenzie. <clears throat> he was a great map maker, and you can rely on his information completely. It has been said that the old hall of Clestron was down here by the shore, and it was deserted after Pirate Gal uh, had um, attacked it some years after. And then the, the hall, new hall, rebuilt here at Clestron. But this map is 1750, which is 19 years before the build date of the Hall of Clestron. Yet there's a big building there, which um, represents a hall and it says Clestron. I don't believe it's a coincidence. It could be that we are dealing with a hall that was already there, but was refurbished in 1769. These are these questions. These are questions which we will probably be able to answer during these excavations, which is quite important. So, can I get the next slide? Thank you. I spoke about the moat. Now, here is a detail of it on the east. Oh, sorry, the west side. There's going to be lots of north, south, east, and west here, um, and you can see water lying. And this is probably the deepest point of the moat. And so there would have been a flow here and a flow that way to an outflow this way. We assume the outflow was going to be on the north side, um, and, but it seems likely not. Uh, can we go to the next? Lovely. <coughs> so here we have um, the north side of the hall. There's a blocked window here. Um, and there's this wonderful uh, entrance into the north side. And the, the, um, moat, the moats terminate there and there. And the building clearly goes a lot deeper than what we see Sorry? 
Andrew, just to let you know, we can't see you moving your mouse oh. on your screen because Julie is displaying, of course. So just so you, just, just so you're aware. Thank oh, you. I see. Right. OK, so along the north face, um, uh, this the building will have gone down underground a lot deeper, a meter or so, which changes the aspect of the hall itself. Now, can we get to the next slide? This was the first part that we uncovered. Um, these slabs were just showing here and, and, the, and part of this slab and it was very muddy, but there was obviously substantial stonework which needed looking at. Um, so Sigrid and I, we merely pulled off the turf just to have a look. And here is the wee drain, um, which Sigrid dug down and unblocked. And this um, area was always filled with water and boggy, but directly that drain was cleared, all water ran away. <clears throat> and we poured water down it, and you could hear it go down and trickle and go into a hollow space, which we found intriguing. Um, we, the, can I get the next slide? This is it, right, this is, this is the um, feature fully uncovered. And we heard from Ivan and Jean that these slabs here were placed in 1953, which is a good date. And the interior of the hall, the ground floor was, the, the, the level of the floor was raised by pouring loads of concrete in. Um, well, we knew this uh, to make a level and firm surface for pig pens because the interior here was turned into pig pens whilst the attic rooms was turned into um, poultry. Now, they said that underneath here was a flight of steps going down. So this was very exciting. And, uh, and so we removed this slab here. Can I get the next? Thank you. Now, <clears throat> here is well the removal of the, of the first slab. Underneath is all this huge chunks of rock. Um, there was a layer of, of sort of sand and maybe a bit of lime here just to um, settle the stones in. But, you know, quite a deliberate fill um, and how, where did all these blocks come from? Well, we surmise um, that it was the destruction of the East Pavilion, which provided the rubble to fill in um, the ground floor of the hall and fill the stair. And then that was simply concreted over, some cement and concreted over, and then the uh, pig pens could be built. So we're, we're revealing the history here. So it looks as though even under all of that, if we could go to the next slide. Yeah, you can see into the hall, but you can see down here, this is the bottom step down in the middle. And that's it. And at the end of it, just under the other threshold, the top threshold, that's it. That is the threshold stone that John Ray will probably have crossed many a time because the north entrance was, was, was the business side of the place where you got out into the farm and you, you did all manner of things. So this was a frequently used uh, way. So we've got really tangible, uh, tangible artifact of, of what John Ray was physically in contact with. So we believe the water runs under this slab and you'll see drainage features later, which we hadn't expected, uh, hadn't really considered it too much. But uh, can we have the next one? Right, now, this is what we've still got to contend with. 
That, these are the pig, pig pens. You see this window here, that did go down to floor level, but it's been blocked up so that the piggies couldn't really see out. Um, and there are acro props at the back, which, uh, and which um, our members sponsored to hold up the floor. And if we hadn't done that, this was before we built, bought the, the hall, that floor would have crashed down and we would likely have lost the building, which would have been a tragedy. But it is, it is saved now. Uh, we've done uh, wind and water tight and the building is drying out, although there's other repairs to do. So <clears throat> one day these pig pens will be removed, the concrete removed, and we'll get down to a floor level. And if the floor is intact, which we believe it, it, it to be, then we will get interesting archeological information about the division of the rooms. Uh, on, uh, towards the left, uh, we know that there was a big kitchen. Uh, the rafters are, um, as the building dries out, you can see the colouring and they are darkly stained with peat smoke. So you can see that there was no, um, uh, uh, there was no lath and plaster in, in the kitchen area. You can't see it yet, but, but we'll find out more later. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Yes, so uh, we needed to look at the face of the hall, the north face. So we decided to, to tie up layers with this edge. And this is when we came across this great drain structure and um, very powerful. Now, it's funny that um, in the 1851 census, it said that there were, I think, half a dozen drainage engineers living in the East Pavilion. So they were there doing some important drainage work. And I would think it is probably this plus other. Um, but it's, it's substantial stuff. Uh, so this is a surmised date, but I think it's probably quite reasonable. Now, if we can have the next slide. Everyone loves drains. So this is inside the drain that's below those stones. And right at the back here is the, that's it, is the uh, wall which supports those big sandstone curbs. At the bottom of this wall, or well, somewhere down there, is, that, is, is deeper than that. Um, we can't see it yet but uh, that is the bottom step. That is where the bottom step level will be. And the water ran under that and we'll see evidence of that uh, shortly. Um, <clears throat> so the idea of putting, we've been talking about a moat going around the other three sides and how um, it was much wider and probably a 45 degree batter some flat space and then a batter, and it would act like a ha-ha. This probably was similar, although not as deep, on the north side of the building. And this drain will have filled that area in, so then it could be resurfaced and gain greater um, cartwheeling space in the, in the, in the northern courtyard. Um, so that is the reason for all of this. Can we get the next one? Here is, there's the big sandstone curb. This is the wall which supports it. And we come down here, that is the bottom step stone. Um, oh, thank you, Canada just joined in. Um, so, and down here is a beautifully carved um, sandstone uh, gutter drain. It's for taking off surface water. Uh, this is almost certainly primary phase. So we're looking at something that John Ray again would have seen. The water coming from the east side running under here because that is the fall and then into the drain. Well he, this drain wouldn't have been here in his time anyway so uh, um, so he will have seen that and his family. 
So we believe this wall and that to have been built probably about the 1850 period when the moat was filled. Okay, next slide. A continuation of said drain with the thick silt in and then turning the corner. Um, there's this big stone here, uh, which had been interfered with in the not too distant past, maybe, I don't know, 50, 80 years ago. We're not sure, but, but somebody got in here to do something to maybe unblock um, something or pull out a sheet that had gone in there, anything could happen. But, but this wall built over it is the um, uh, end wall of the moat going around the west side and there's a lovely coin stone there so and we know that this is quite late um, it is built over the top of it is actually built over an 1880 uh, benchmark so if we can get the next slide Just like drains, everybody loves a benchmark. There we are, 1880, and the top part of the wall is built over that. So, on to the next. There's quite good dating evidence. Here we are, the uh, silt has been taken out, and we've got this beautiful drain running this way, and you can see the fall. Um, and there was constant water coming up. We were pumping it out continually, and uh, uh, but we, we managed to get this, and this was towards the end of the excavation, uh, and you know, it, was, it was raining a lot as well, but uh, that was a super thing to see. Okay, the next one. This is where we looked a moment ago. Um, it's, this is an earlier photograph and uh, where the, the, this feature was put in, which is a drain going north. It's not very substantial. It probably, we're, we're not totally sure of its purpose or exactly how far and where it goes, but we will find out. But it was likely to relieve a, a, surfeit, a, a surfeit of water at some time. Um, the walls are prone to damp, and um, so that would be good to get rid of. Okay, next one. This is looking to the drainage walls here, which was filling the moat, and then the backfill up to the walls. This was the water supply into the hall, which was put in, I don't know exactly what date, um, but we, did, we didn't touch it just in case it was still live. But you can see this thick mud and midden that was dumped in. And there was, it was mixed with a cartload of um, glacial till from somewhere, and then a cartload of, of midden from somewhere. And it was quite mixed. There were some interesting finds in, in, in these layers, which I'll show you later. But we did find an edge. It's not shown here, but we found an edge to this moat sloping down, which was about 18 feet from the face of the north wall. So you can imagine this slope down and along the drainage um, feature we don't know what the bottom of the moat was like yet. We'd not got to that level because the rain started and we couldn't get down there, but we will. Um, so, and, and also how this stair was accessed. So it's a big feature and it looks as though what the system was, was the, the original builders dug out a huge slice of land down to a good solid um, uh, layer and then built the hall on top of that. So what we're, what we're looking at now is a partly buried building and it will be nice to be able to 
reveal what it was like, whether we can keep it like that in the future or whether we can just explain it remains to be seen. And there are a lot of more remains to be seen later. Um, can I get the next slide? The East Pavilion. This is the back wall to it, although it's been interfered with a great deal. Uh, there's a door here. Um, that's not the original exit door, it's somewhere else. There's a corner at this point. If you come over, there's a corner, you go to the right, there's a corner coming this way. And down here in midfield is the foundations of the uh, west wall of the east wing. And then we've got a big, um, a big threshold slab here and we've got sort of sometimes quite random, very poor cement uh, flooring with some slab flooring here at a lower level. And at this point up here, we have right at the back, uh, we have distinct uh, cobbled stable flooring. And uh, there's a wee gully coming down here, which would have taken uh, horsey urine away. So that is the picture of that. We've not got to the original floor of the, uh, the building, but we can look at that uh, next season probably. Okay, the next slide. The East Pavilion looking west. Uh, so here's a line of slabs, which we saw before. Uh, this here was a post hole. Um, and that's your threshold, but down here is um, a stone built kist like structure. We haven't got the entirety of it. Uh, it's about a foot or so deep, but it may have contained uh, some form of maybe a lead um, horse trough or something. We don't, we, don't, we don't know, there are questions. It might just be a bed for herbs, but being right by a stable, uh, it could well be something connected to horse troughs, maybe water fed from a roof or something, we don't know. And, but up here is the, you can just see at, at the bottom of the photograph here, up this end, that, that actual stable flooring, which is still quite good um, and uh, quite sharp. On to the vines. The next slide. Here we are, small finds, and they not vast quantities, but very good, very good information. We have a complete, uh, complete tile or slate from the roof, well, archaeologically complete, so we've got a good measurement on that. Um, the bones here are mutton, quite, quite an old beast, and I can testify to the splendor of mutton. Uh, it's wonderful. This, um, the, the brown pottery here is what I call a Glasgow teapot. That might not be its classification, but they were made in Glasgow in some of the big potteries there. We've got spongeware, which is this very colourful ware. Now, this is the best and finest spongeware I've ever seen. It's much higher fired than the normal farm spongeware that you, you see. Um, it's got banded decoration, brush decoration, brush squiggles, a green that I've not noticed on spongeware before. This is possibly part of the same or similar vessel with printed works and that sponge printing going along there. And this is very fine printed china. That's the back of the base of a, a splendid wee saucer. And of course, that's a terrific cup with a lovely handle. Now we've found virtually no peasant wares. You would expect to find bits of cream jar and uh, old big jugs and flagons and things, but we found none of that. It's, it's quite interesting. And we found no, this is why they, you can't see them, there's no evidence of clay pipes and clay pipe smoking, nothing. So maybe they just had cigars. And now another find, next slide. A 1921 penny, quite good condition. This was found just at the, um, at the front of the, the major curbstone 
and uh, it was in such a position that one might have thought it was a votive deposit, but I'm sure it just fell out of a, a pocket. Uh, and, and the last, well, the next slide is a shining example of a candelabra. It's bronze or brass. It was found in the um, west moat and it indicates quite, you know, high status lifestyle. It, it's either some piano scone, a sconce from a piano or part of a major chandelier. And there is a, a major chandelier hook in the, um, in the northern uh, reception room on the first floor. You can still see the hook there and there will have been a grand chandelier. Perhaps this is part of it. We don't know. There are probably several chandeliers there. Uh, and the next slide. Here we have grateful thanks to Paul Johnson, buildings archaeologist, and Gail Drinkle, uh, curator of um, finds and photographer, and she's done the photography. Um, uh, I asked them to come in to, to help because uh, this had to be done professionally and to the highest of standards, and they have been terrific in providing those high standards. Casey Construction, uh, they've lent us specialized mechanical digger work uh, and trench barriers and, uh, to, to protect the trenches and also uh, a cabin, which was our dig hut. And as I mentioned first, very sadly, uh, late a Ivan Craigie. Now he did a lot of mechanical digger work for us, filling in and clearing some ground. And he, he gave us such gener generous practical support. And OAS for er earlier archaeological funding, the Kaminga Trust for earlier archaeological funding, and of course our team of socially distanced volunteers. Can I have the final picture? There we are. Here's the traditional pineapple, which means luxury, wealth, and do support OAS, OHS, and JRS. Thank you. Thanks for indeed, Andrew. That was that was uh, very interesting. Um, and as a civil engineer who cut his teeth in drainage. I, I can't yes. help but um, finding that thing about there's a, there's, a, there's a hole in the garden and there's a man looking down it. So um, yeah. so thank you very thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, do we have any questions that have come in? Um, Haley, are you taking the questions or Julie? I'm not sure if, if we had any in, in the chat. Yeah, hi. I'm, yeah, I'm uh, Neil. I've been looking at the chat, but there's been no questions that have come through so far. So I don't know if anybody's got anything maybe if they want to put their hand up if we can see them oh, I've got, I see, David, I see David Craig is yep. uh, waving his hands can he be oh, sorry, unmuted thank you okay Go. I've unmuted myself yes um the levels of the ground at the at the at the main steps at the front mm -hmm. the main steps seem to come down to the current level of the ground so do you think they were always like that they do. There, there is another step that we've seen. We've not looked at that area. Uh, they could come down further. Uh, there's been a lot of build up of soil uh, around there. So um, uh, uh, yet we've we've not looked, but it's something we will definitely need to look at. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David. Oh, but incidentally, under the four stair, that four stair, we have found evidence of a well. Um, and the this drainage system we've been talking about um, uh, on the uh, on the east side, the drain goes down away from the well, and on the west side, it goes down a drain away from the well. So so all foul water is drained away from this. So there will be no foul water entering that well. And uh, it's um, very cleverly constructed. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Um, any... Okay, so there's been oh. a, a question put in the chat from Lynn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
so there's a question been put in the chat from Lynn to Andrew. So Lynn's saying there's been much reference to a moat, but are we actually talking about water surrounding the hall or is it just a reference to the drainage, which is a feature of the moat? It's a dry moat. It, it, it's a dry moat. We've, we've called it a moat because um, that feet, that's a, an architectural name for that sort of feature, but it is a dry moat. It was not designed to be filled with water. There were no ducks floating on it. So. Uh, okay. Uh, anything else there, Haley? Or has anybody else okay. got any? I'm not seeing. Last question. I'm not seeing any. Okay. okay. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is ask, uh, sorry, Hayley, were you going to say something? Sorry. Um, I'll ask Sandra to uh, to pick up the baton and explain what's going on uh, now with the, with the project. And then we'll have an opportunity for questions for Sandra. And indeed, if you think of anything else you want to ask Andrew, we can pick those up at the end after Sandra's done her piece. Sandra, um, over to you. Thank you, Neil. I'll just say upload, share my screen. Okay, um, good evening everyone and thank you for inviting me along this evening. Um, my name is Sandra Deans and as project manager of the Hall of Plestrum Development, I've been asked to give you an update on the progress of the project. The unprecedented events over the last six months have proven to be very challenging and continues to be so. However, like many, uh, the board has embraced online technology, which has enabled major advances in design and potential use, even during this difficult period. Um, before I go any further, I just want to reassure everyone uh, that although there is no physical change to the hall itself, um, there has been an enormous amount of work going on behind the scenes. All I can say is thank goodness for online technology. Um, the society aims to preserve and renovate the Hall of Clestron, an exceptional but derelict and at risk category A listed Palladian villa completed in 1769, creating a world class visitor centre and a vibrant community resource where people feel enriched inspired and can revel in its unique history and spectacular setting. The hall is remarkable for having had little alteration since its construction. It has escaped the layer of uh, 19th century alterations that normally occur in Scottish houses of this status. Having suffered damage in major storms, the building would be greatly improved by the reinstatement of lost elements such as the original roof material, uh, the missing pediment, the characterful interiors and the missing eastern pavilion. The restoration of these elements would considerably add to the understanding and interpretation of the place. The original beauty and elegance of its design would be be recovered. Possibly the highest significance of the Hall of Clestrin is not the architecture, however, it is the association with Dr. John Ray, the great Arctic explorer, who has much greater resonance with people and climate and environment in the 21st century than most of his contemporaries. A project at the Hall of Clestrin, which builds on his life, would achieve much more than simply the historic restoration of an important building. The story is important for Orkney, but also internationally as an integral part of Arctic exploration history. The, call, uh, the hall has been made wind and water tight, but it remains fragile. And with Orkney's often extreme weather, as we all know this, there is no guarantee that these temporary measures will hold. Full rest restoration is the only real long-term solution, but in order to attract the necessary large-scale funding that will allow this to happen, the society has to find 
a sustainable use for the buildings. The extraordinary commit commitment shown by the uh, society's volunteers and supporters, their generous donations of both time and money, as well as financial and peer support of the Orkney Islands Economic Development Department with their Community Development Fund plus grants, um, plus grants from the Architectural Heritage Fund, the Co-op Community Fund and the Kaminga Trust has enabled uh, the board to take truly giant steps in progressing the planned hall development. The Society was extremely fortunate to have been able to commission John Sanders of Simpson and Brown Heritage Consultants and Architects based in Edinburgh, a true hall of pleasure and enthusiasts to, um, to produce an outline conservation maintenance plan, which will inform decisions around its conservation, development, design and maintenance. Luckily, John was able to travel to Orkney to assess a hall and speak directly with the trustees before the lockdown commenced in March. Then in April, Rob, Rob Robinson of Heritage Consulting Limited was co contracted to carry out a full options appraisal, feasibility studies, outline business plan and activity plan. And lastly, uh, he produced briefs for the design and of the proposed new development. Rob worked in conjunction with Simpson and Brown, uh, who were contracted to produce the architectural detail for the option appraisal, and these were costed by Angus Simpson of Ralph Oak Surveyors. All the consultants have worked closely with each other, and this led to the well considered and detailed information that was provided, finally provided. The full options appraisal covered in detail the conservation needs, site and planning restrictions, a detailed description and illustrations of the options, along with detailed costs, and a full comparative appraisal of the three options to arrive at a recommended proposal. Um, in order to obtain realistic costings for the project, the Society asked um, consultants Simpson and Brown to uh, draft sample plans of how the buildings might look. What they submitted is only one of the many possible designs. The final approved designs will come from the successful tenderer the project and will be approved by the trustees at that time. The detailed options appraisal will investigate three options for the project, ranging from a modest building on the footprint of the ruined two twin barn pavilion to an outstanding new centre which will, will link the hall, the surviving pavilion and the new twin. These evolved into a preferred selected preferred option, although with a capital cost around 8 million plus VAT. This was considered by the consultants as a, and trustees as too large a project for the society to fund and develop at, at this time. A three-phase approach was recommended and developed. The full and final project proposes to be an award-winning centre combining heritage conservation with contemporary design, an iconic building appropriately celebrating the memory of John Ray and providing a window into the world of Arctic exploration in the past, present and future. The overall concept of the proposed centre places the John Ray Society uh, so places the John Ray story at the heart of interpretation, connecting the stories of the Hall of Clestron, the Hudson's Bay Company and um, Canada, and of Arctic exploration, past, present and future. It is expected that the experience will be highly interactive and experiential, 
allowing visitors to experience the times and adventures of Chonri and the hostility, beauty and fragility of the Arctic. Although the full experience will not be available until phase three, the concept runs through all phases and it is to be expanded and improved with phase one, including augmented reality interpretation within the hall. The project aims to provide a fitting international legacy for John Ray encourage more people to be involved with heritage, enhance community pride, well-being and facilities in the area, increase and improve the economic impact of tourism on Orkney, be at the fore of improving and strengthening Scotland's Arctic connections, work in partnership to grow and share an understanding of the Arctic through education, research, knowledge transfer and cultural awareness, inspire, sorry, inspire a, a spirit of Arctic adventure and endeavor and build organizational resilience and sustainability. So, the proposed Phase one has a development cost of 400,000 and a capital cost of 3.3 million plus VAT and prioritizes the main hall and the West Pavilion. This phase includes reception, retail and temporary exhibition in the basement in the, the ground floor augmented reality interpretation on the principal floor and public research education in the attic. Up here. Uh, and then um, as well as a cafe in the West Pavilion. The ground floor of the main hall will be a permanent exhibition with glass floor sections revealing the archaeology and original building fabric. The principal floor uh, will include um, recreated rooms, exhibition and augmented reality uh, interpretation. And the upper floor will house the visitor or public education and research space. The West Pavilion houses the cafe, kitchen, store and toilets. Uh, the cafe will have an indoor seating area for approximately 50 guests, plus an additional outdoor area. Um, externally, the project includes an Arctic garden. Uh, and walking trails, areas to relax and enjoy, um, parking potentially for 40 cars, including four disabled spaces and two coach uh, parking bays. Um, there will be a new road that comes down from the offer, main offer road down to the hall this way um, with parking here. So you have the hall and um, the West Pavilion here. Um, I'll let you have a minute to have a look at that. The proposed uh, phase two prioritises a new build pavilion uh, here in the east which is for dedicated community use, including a community meeting room in the lower area here, GRS office accommodation, toilets, plant, and a space for academic research and education in the top section. The buildings will at this point remain detached. There will be no connection. Um, 
and uh, that will come in in the next phase, which is the full concept proposal. Um, the full concept proposal phase three uh, joins all three buildings together with a new build section covering the courtyard in, in between, which will include the main entrance, reception and retail, temporary exhibition space and toilets as well. And the main part of the courtyard will house the permanent multimedia and highly interactive um, exhibitions. Renewables will underpin the energy generation and needs of the building and are likely to include wind, a ground source heat pump and to a lesser extent solar PV and thermal um, supported by high levels of heat retention through design and materials. Um, I'll, I'll go into the next page. In terms of the design precedence, um, the exhibitions are expected to have a high level of technology, including immersive experiences, supplemented by more traditional elements such as handling items and opportunities to take part in Arctic related activities and research. Um, I must reiterate that these are just concept designs, not final designs, which have been developed as part of the options appraisals. But there has been considerable uh, trustee consultation to ensure that the designs produced meet with uh, the trustees' expectations and uh, the project's requirements. Invitations for the final design tender will be made through the public contracts uh, through Public Contracts Scotland because of the potential size of the contract. <clears throat> the business plan figures suggest a sufficient annual operating surplus to sustain a viable operation for the centre across all three phases. Under phase one, the anticipated model shows a very healthy cumulative operating surplus of 630,000 generated for reinvestment at the end of the first 10 years. Under sensitivity, under the sensitivity analysis, which is a 20% reduction, this cumulative surplus is reduced to around 250,000. Um, this does not include any additional potential sources of income generation, such as music events, and further savings could potentially be made closing uh, completely for several months during the winter, although the trustees are very keen to provide a year-round facility. Comparatively, uh, our consultants believe this is a very uh, healthy starting point for a heritage project. Uh, an outline activity plan will also be commissioned to develop, uh, well it was commissioned uh, to develop and summarise the proposed activities of the society as part of the overall project. It is, uh, however, only an outline plan and a full activity plan will need uh, will be needed in support of a stage two National Lottery Heritage Fund application. These uh, sustainable activities will deliver long term benefit, will encourage more people from across uh, from all cross sections of Orkney's community and beyond to visit the centre and engage in local heritage, will become, become involved in Arctic exploration, discovery and conservation. Um, activities include an Arctic club, uh, hard heart tours during the restoration, John Reed tours in association hopefully with the Strumman's Museum and um, the exhibition ship, the, the exploration ships that come in have, have expressed an interest in that area as well. Arctic uh, festivals, storytelling, 
um, lots of things. There's many more activities proposed and these will evolve with the project. Archaeology will, of course, underpin and inform the whole project. Um, next steps, uh, the full funding plan, a full funding plan has been identified for the development phase and the delivery phase of the project. Uh, with the production of a robust and viable business plan fundamental to most funding applications. This funding process has now begun in earnest with an application to Historic Environment Scotland's repair grant for 500k in December, a key funder for the historic renovation of the hall itself. We should hear this week whether the application was successful or not, so fingers crossed. Uh, the society is now well placed to apply to the National Lottery Fund, Heritage Fund, the principal funder identified for the project. Um, an expression of interest has been recently submitted and a decision will be made within 20 days of that application. Um, the future timeline is difficult to gauge uh, because it's down to the National Lottery uh, board to determine whether they feel the society and the project is ready to move forward. The National Lottery will invite the society to apply for funding for the development. Um, that's phase one of the project, hopefully mid to late uh, this year, 2021. The suggested time scale for the development period is 12 to 18 months. Uh, during this period, a project action plan will cover architecture, um, interpretation and digital output plans, planning, detailed timetable and costs, full business, conservation, environmental activities and evaluation plans, and a full project fundraising strategy and plan uh, will be put in place as well. Only once the National Lottery believe uh, that the society is ready, will they be invited to apply for the final delivery phase of the grant? Um, the society has confirmed in principle offers of financial support from the OSC and HI. Uh, this and the letters of support from key stakeholders provides welcome endorsement of the project, an important factor when building confidence with external funders. Of course, donations have made a huge impact uh, to the development of the project and will remain a vital and extremely welcome consideration. Um, the OIC planning department has been approached with the proposed full concept design to seek pre-planning advice and they advised the prince uh, that the principal and overall approach to the development is acceptable. This formal response will inform the final design brief. And we are now in receipt of our professional VAT position report, which will ensure the society adopts an efficient VAT position during the project phases. Highly important that we get this right, um, a lot of money there that we could um, recover. The trustees and I will continue to liaise with the community and stakeholders both here and in Canada to galvanise and record community support for the project. And um, this was never going to be an easy pro process, but it's felt that now is the right time for this project. Um, building on the Scottish Government focus for uh, based on the Arctic agenda. The society has developed a project proposal for the whole of Plestrum that is entirely appropriate, international in outlook, but firmly grounded in the uniqueness and special qualities of the hall and the surrounding area. It is with uh, the support from the local community, from local organisations such as yourselves, and financial commitment from funders that these advances have been possible. Thank you for your time and uh, I welcome any questions. I'll, Sandra. I'll, I'll actually um, show you this. Um, drawing that was produced by Simpson and Brown. It's a conjectural sort of restoration 
uh, of the Hall of Clestrin showing the pavilions on either side with a wall joining it and with the pediment. Um, and I think it's uh, it kind of gives you a feel for what the society is hoping to achieve um, moving forward. Sandra, thanks very much indeed for all of that. That was uh, that was very interesting to see it all pulled together. And, and I see we've got quite a few questions that, that came in there. So um, Hayley, do you want to sort of um, uh, uh, dosh those out because um, there are a couple on the construction side of things which I can happily take if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I've not got the question in front of me. Yeah, thanks, Hayley, no, sorry, I was just unmuting yeah, myself. Don't worry, go for it. Yeah, no, I've got it. Um, yeah, so sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself quickly. So um, I'll go through the questions pretty much in the order that we've got them. The first one um, came through from Helen Green and it was a general question saying to me saying, just wondering in the parking area whether EV charging and cycles will be accommodated. And I think that also links to a question um, that's been raised from Lynn, which is, forgive me if this has already been answered, what's been done about car parking? It looks like there's big plans, but we need to get people to the hall and car parks aren't very bonny which is a fair comment. Sandra, should I pick that bit up? Yeah, you, 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 you go. Okay. Yeah. Sandra, could, could you flick back in your presentation to the plan shot um, that it was, I think it was at phase two, it's the one that, um, yeah, that there's, there's one here. So just to let everybody know, the, um, the oh, I'll wait till we get to this. That, that's the one, thank you. Yeah. So the car parking area you can see is a sort of the grey uh, Q shape um, uh, there. Thanks for the cursor there. Um, which and and the grey line to the right, uh, heading out diagonally, sort of nearly forty five degrees to the right, is is the access road. So we've got planning permission for the access road uh, right the way up uh, to the junction with the main author road. Um, and we are just looking at the process by which that, that's going to get put in. There is actually an existing roadway or hardened track down that route um, already, but we'll be making some changes to, to bring it up to the sort of the highway specification. So we'll have a, a route in. You notice that the car park itself is not set on the axis of the hall. It's set off to one side. So if one comes straight north from the hall, because the windows look out directly to the north, you won't be looking out into the car park. The car park is off to the right hand side as you look out of those windows. The car park itself will probably be a hardened soil surface rather than it being a tarmac area. Um, but we need to be aware that if we're going to be turning coaches in there, and the car park is specifically designed so that coaches don't have to reverse for the safety reasons um, of people milling around and coaches moving backwards. Um, the, the surfacing on that car park, we're going to have to work out exactly what will be feasible there. In terms of um, cycles, um, the intention is to put a, a cycle way and footpath down the side of the road into the hall. So from the author road, right the way down to the site. Um, it'll be a, a plan to be a shared cycle and, and footpath. Um, th th there'll naturally be bike for, um, storage provision or um, a tie-up areas there. In terms of the electric vehicle side of things, um, there'll probably be um, at least a couple of charge points, but principally we're not necessarily expecting that people will need to charge at the site. So the intention, the likelihood is, and this is me speaking with my renewables hat on, is that vehicles will tend to be charged at night when people are at home and, and to sleep and will then have enough charge in them to do what they want to do during their day. However, given the strong winds we get in Orkney, the fact that tourists are going to places they don't necessarily know, we need to have a get you out of the I don't know what the architectural word for it is. Anyway, let's say Maya, um, get you out of a, 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 the problems if you arrived at the site and didn't have charging. So they'll probably be charging for staff and the activities that go on at the hall um, and probably a, a charge point which would allow people at least to, to, to get you home type charge. But we don't think it needs to be a major charging hub uh, for, for major infrastructure. Um, I think that was the point on the cycles and car park and charging. Can I come in for a moment, Neil? Yeah, Andrew, go for it. Um, there was a question about car parking being ugly, and I totally agree. 
That's why it is sited where it is. And we have enough land around it to be able to <coughs> grow screening to uh, break up the hardness of the car park. And likewise, uh, up the entrance road, we, we can have plantings up there of selected uh, shrubbery um, uh, to, to take away the hard lines of the tracks and all that sort of thing. It's been quite highly considered. <coughs> can I, sorry, can I also add, um, within this area here, um, the society hoped to develop sort of natural gardens. Um, we had hoped to have a sort of pond area within this area here, but um, the uh, regulations state that we need to have a fire fighting water supply. However, we want to soften that and make it more natural as well. Um, and the pass out to this area, we hope to make accessible for people, you know, to be able to go out and uh, even those that are less able um, to access that, that areas. The, 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 the key is to have the hall as accessible for as many people as possible. That's that's one of the aims of, um, of this project. The car park originally was, was going to be sited near here in this field where the fire pond is, but because of the likelihood of extremely important archaeology under there, the car park has uh, very wisely been moved to a place where there's no archaeology and also out of view of the hall. Um, the fire pond, it's questionable whether it'll be there. Uh, it should be further out away because that's going to also interfere with probably vital archaeology. But, but these are all plans. And, and somebody um, mentioned in an earlier question, uh, what if Andrew finds more and more stuff, what happens? Well, the, the thing is, if you do not do the archaeology and consider it first, you can really come unstuck because with building and rushed, you'll find stuff which you hadn't expected and you have to scrap your plans, pay for the archaeology and also and, and start over again. So what we're trying to do is do the archaeological assessment first so that we're not trapped into a situation where we are stuck. But um, there we are. And, and this, this area, we can get a natural pond because it is a swampy area. We can have low lying water um, and in, in, enhance the biodiversity there uh, and make it a very interesting uh, feature. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. I'm just going to pick up the point that David Craig made about um, the. the yeah, I was, I was going to say, I was going to pick up the point there that David made about electric cars, um, uh, about day visitors. Yeah, David, we fully recognise um, the opportunities with electric cars for that. I, I drive one myself um, and involved in writing the EV strategy. So, yeah, we, we will make sure there is provision. What I'm saying is it's not likely to be a major charging hub, um, that there will be enough for, for, for people to use it. Um, Hayley, do you want to ask the next one? Okay, Neil, there's a, there's a question that's come through. Yeah, Neil, there's a question that came through from Keith um, asking if the project will be at least carbon neutral. Good question. And we, and we are very focused on, on making sure that designs are contemporary and are, are done in a sustainable way. So, for example, um, the road is likely to be using pre-existing uh, quarries uh, waste as opposed to specifically imported aggregates. Knowing I'm not going to get into an aggregates uh, discussion now, um, uh, but it's, it's anticipated that that, that will be um, a local material. One of the challenges we've got is with the hall itself in terms of the um, the capacity to insulate the hall, um, but we're making sure that we do whatever we can and do the right thing. So we're hoping we would, well, we anticipate you know, proper uh, refenestration, i.e. decent windows properly insulated. We've got to be careful about the moisture movements within the walls of the building, given it's a natural, um, the natural building. But we were, we are anticipating putting in uh, ground source heat pumps um, and the we'll put those boreholes in the car park and all the land available. The um, uh, Sandra mentioned 
um, probably photovoltaics and or solar thermal because there'll be higher water con water usage in the pavilion for, for the uh, cafe. They would go on the new roofs, not on the hall itself, but on the new roofs of the pavilions facing uh, west. Um, and we'd also anticipate putting in one or two uh, five or six kilowatt wind turbines uh, to give us um, uh, a, su a supply of power. Um, so overall, yes, there, we're very focused on making sure it is sustainably done. The, the structure that um, uh, Sandra showed uh, between the two pavilions is actually a, a timber grid shell. Um, so that's using um, uh, timber as opposed to using uh, steelwork. So yeah, we are we're, we're on that um, and we're open to ideas as well. Um, uh, if people have got um, examples or items that we feel would be useful to, uh, to bring into the plan. I think what, what we've got to remember is that uh, whatever pro, you know, designs we have will be taken uh, to, for, uh, forward for community consultation. Um, we want to you know, work with the community, make sure this is done properly. Um, but certainly there is a, a, a wish um, to make this as an energy efficient and carbon neutral uh, project as possible and we will work with uh, Reflex and Community en Energy Scotland to uh, achieve that. We have been directed to the engine shed, uh, I think it's down in uh, Central Belt, um, who are specialists in um, sort of historic um, listed buildings development and the um, engineering of any insulation uh, properties that need to, or materials that need to be input into the building. So, um, you know, we will work in conjunction with these people uh, and take advice, particularly from Historic Environment Scotland. And they, they are cast, you know, they're taking on this, um, you know, they, they want to, um, make sure that everything is as is, is, uh, efficient as possible as well, uh, but retain the the character and the authenticity of the building that we have. Okay, thanks. The next question is from Nigel Jennings. Um, if everything went according to plan, when do you envisage the building being open to visitors? Phase uh, one. Uh, everything going to plan, uh, no holdups, uh, spring 25. Open to the public. Okay, we've got that on the record, Sandra, so we'll hold you <laughs> to that. <laughs> um, uh, I've got a, a comment really more than a question, but from Chris Matthews. Um, lots of wonderful ideas but the physical concept for phase three with a covered courtyard looks horrific and ruins the building. So I don't know if there's a response required on that, but I think it is a, a comment that you put, I'm sure you'll get plenty of those uh, as well as yeah. the ones that really love it. Um, there's a question. Yeah. So go on, Sandra. I, I, I think, you, you know, we welcome this. This is why we need to speak people we need to get feedback uh, uh, from the community as uh, to their thoughts on 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 these designs um, because that will inform the final design once that's uh, pulled together um, so if we can get as much feedback now then that's great appreciate everything whether it's you know as uh, we take everything as being constructive can i come in yes uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, the, this building here in front of the hall does block the, the excellent view from the north. Um, now, we have plenty of land. We bought extra land. This, this could be sited at another place, but this is going to be a, a lot of architectural consultation uh, on this, and, and this has been designed like this so we can, we can actually get a costing. It's not necessarily what is going to be. We have to um, think of a plan, cost it, and then we've got um, the, the ideas of where we can go, and it will be up to the final 
architect's concept uh, what is going to happen and there'll be a lot of discussion uh, with those as well. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I think the next question is from somebody whose username is Pilates. Um, what are the plans for the walled garden? I can come in here. Um, we, we have no plans for the walled garden currently. We do not own it. Uh, initially, we wanted to purchase the walled garden, but it was withdrawn. Um, however, um, we certainly, uh, we've it said we can, we can do archeological research into it. We can find out a lot more of its history and features. And we have actually been working on this. And um, a, a survey has been done of, of the plant life that's in there and, and what could have been there. So um, uh, that, that is part of the general archeological scheme for the future. Uh, the current archaeological scheme is concerned with, with, with the, the immediate area, but then we're going to expand out into that. And if anybody wants to do research on it, please do. Be delighted. Thank you. Okay, um, next comment really is, uh, well, there's, again, there's a couple of comments, but the next question uh, from C.A. Welling, the phase one concept plan doesn't anticipate the later phases that Sandra talked about. Could this be a problem? Um, I'm not sure uh, what he means by that, but I, I you know, the, 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 the three concepts have been developed so that they um, can be developed over a period of time. Uh, and when money is sourced. Um, so, at the, you know, the, the, the first pavilion, the West Pavilion, is obviously in situ at the moment. And we know there's fans there for the um, East Pavilion and from the pictures that uh, Andrew pulled up. So um, it would be great to, you know, bring the, 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 the building back to how it originally looked. Um, going back to the sort of uh, reconstruction uh, design that uh, or illustration that uh, John Sanders developed um, you know having the oh good on you know having the pavilions join to each other by the wall in here with a sheltered courtyard in behind so it, it it's really important to the society to keep this as um, genuine and as authentic and to the original design as possible. That's the kind of um, the thought process behind this. Um, and to make it a sustainable and um, forward looking venture, you know, having the bit in, be in behind the, the um, the inter the bit that interlinks uh, the the three buildings um, that allows access for people to maneuver to come and go access to different areas um, and also showcase um, you know the developments that are happening in Orkney hopefully um, over what's happening at the moment and what's potentially what, what will happen in the future uh, in relation to the Arctic. Um, so that's kind of where, the, where it's, it's, it's come from. Sandra Haley, can, can I just follow up my question? Mm -hmm. um, this, the, the, the image you've got on the screen now looks very much like something was being put back to the way it was. And yet the later designs looked very modern, obviously. Um, my original thought was that were you actually uh, putting things somewhere where you want to build on it later? Do you know, it was a bit like, you know, dumping the spoil from an archeological dig right on something that you need to dig up a year or two down the road sort of thing. You know, that was my original thought. But now following up from some of the other points that people are making, this thing that you've got, this drawing you've got on the screen now looks really old and yet, is that what the end of those two new buildings are going to look like? Obviously not. They're completely new 
new constructions. And, 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 and if, if the idea was to go back to a, a, a much older phase of the building, where's that moat, you know? You're not going back to the moat, which is like a ha-ha, like Andrew said, you know? Yeah. I, I don't get it. I think it's a mess. I think it's a mess of, of one idea and another idea. The best thing I've heard, the very best thing I've heard is all that kind of thinking ahead about being energy efficient and kind of like using sustainable and good materials and all of that is brilliant, you know, and, and the idea of making the place much more like as it was. I love all of that. I, I have doubts about whether joining um, a very famous um, Arctic worker, explorer, etc., John Ray, to an 18th century house. It's, it's not all that logical, really. I mean, he happened to be born there. But, but hey, <laughs> hey, the idea of having a lovely Arctic research centre here is brilliant. Anyway, I just wanted to add. I, th I, I think, uh, you know, in terms of, I'll, I'll come back to you, in terms of the West Pavilion, this pavilion here, um, then obviously it, it, it exists. Um, there's a big opening there currently um, and planning have expressed that they no longer want to see that large opening. Um, the, the, the East Pavilion, yes, we are trying to retain the same original look. However, the, the building material that will be used within this building will make it very modern. You know, it will, will look a different, it looks, this is a, a, a sort of reconstruction, um, but the materials used here will look um, very modern. Uh, we're talking about wood facing, um, you know, different uh, roofing materials, lot of glass within the other, the, the far off end gable. Um, so, um, there is a difference there. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm not showing this is a reconstruction and and, and it, this is how they think uh, the building looked, um, you know, back in 1769. Um, but um, the, the materials, I mean, the hall is the, 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 the priority here. And um, there, there has been, we will do a full, and Andrew will probably back me up on this, uh, you know, a building survey um, and have the archaeologists come in and read this building. Um, there are signs that there has been a pediment there. We have the archive information that we pulled up um, and it relates to a round uh, window, which is nowhere else in this, in, in this building. Um, so we have the evidence um, you know, both in picture format and in um, archive detail and in archaeological uh, feedback uh, evidence. And, and once the roof, uh, the asbestos roof that's re removed, it, once, it, once we remove that structure, um, we'll find out what's underneath and that will very much determine the direction that this takes, uh, this development takes. Andrew, I don't know whether you have anything to yeah, yeah, I do. Kerry, um, with the archaeological research we're doing and looking at the moats and all sorts of things like this and assessing, we are actually learning. We're learning a great deal. And the plans will all... All right. Has anybody else lost Andrew? Uh -huh. Oh, what a shame. Okay, he'll, he'll be back. The important... Uh, so the Andrew, sorry, these, these, sorry, these Andrew, two we, we, joining walls here, there is no real evidence for them at the moment in the ground. They might have been there, but we'll find this out. So you know, give us time. We'll find out. Yes. Neil, there's a fair few other questions. There's a good discussion going on about the pros and cons of the design. I've outed myself as a fan of brutalism, so that probably will go down quite well. Um, I think that there's also a few other bits and pieces there. Um, we've got a question here from David about has planning commented on the physical aspects of phase three, um, which I think has probably been vaguely covered, but I don't know if anybody wants to pick that up as a direct question. Andrew, do you want to comment on the conversations we're planning so far? Um, it 
it's yeah no neil i'll, I'll leave you maybe to okay so so, so a, a couple of things um the, the whole in, in general you need to decide which of the views that you really uh, cherish the most and and what is it that you want to do so the the um the watercolor at the end was very much the view that you have as you come down the driveway which in the in the upper photograph here would be coming from the right looking at the front of the building you wouldn't really see the the grid shell uh, from that direction so the view as you walk up to the house would pr be pretty much invisible to um uh, to, to people walking in you just see the tips of the, of the roof the other thing we've got to be aware of is that people will be approaching the hall from a different direction and that is that they're going to come off the road the main author road and and basically he'd be heading pretty much due west down the hill and seeing uh, hoy mouth um uh, and gramsy in front of with the, with the hall in the foreground and the structures that are shown there are very much hidden by the pavilions as you come down the come down the track so it we, we're conscious of what can be done with with some of the perspectives but these are the sorts of things that need to be flushed out in, in further discussions we're planning and working out what's the art of the possible so David asked a question as well about um, climate change and impacts and storminess. Um, so having lost the roof at least once, um, probably more often, um, that is a massive structure for uplift on that roof. And certainly making sure that the roof stays tied down is going to be one of the key construction activities in, in this. The site itself is, I think, from recollection, is at about 28 to 30 metres above sea level. So... Um, I don't, we're not too worried about that and the and the, the it's got a hard shore so we're not expecting an erosion issue um on the site um uh but it is noticeable that a lot of the windows have been blocked in particularly on the west side because clearly they got fed up with having weather through them so we we are we are under no illusions of the need for the quality of the materials that will need to go in to make sure that this building stays weatherproofed and still there at the end of the 21st century because it we it barely made it out of the 20th and so it was caught just in time really um so i, I don't there's not not much else to say in terms of the um the climate change side i would have thought I also think there's a, a question from David Craig asking if we if there's enough sorry there's a question from David Craig asking if there's enough money to keep the building I think that's intact whilst the grant providers faff about um, well there has to be we, we've we've got a key well the point is we need we're pushing on very hard and Sandra's doing a sterling job of getting other assorted applications lined up and getting into heritage lottery fund and, and and every other fund we can find however if you have got a large pot of cash sitting around um Sandra will gladly give you her address um because um you know we it, it is it is definitely touch and go we recognize that maintaining the building and, and preventing it turning into another rubble pile is, is fundamental. So we have to get on with this. The reason for the three phasing, as Sandra said, is very much to make sure that the building is stabilized early on in that process. But also the creation of the cafe gives us an income stream, which then means that we've then got money to then start to do the other pieces. So although the, although the cafe might be seen as a nice to do, it's actually fundamental to doing two things. One, it generates an income. Two, it generates footfall. And hopefully some of the people who will come to the site will be inspired by the location and, and the discussions about John Ray. And hopefully that will open up their, their purses and pocketbooks and try and generate some of the money that we need to, to do the rest of it. So um, money is is it has been extremely hand to mouth and I coming quite late to this as one of the trustees have been very amazed um, at the sterling work that's been done at fundraising to date and you know my absolute admiration for, for drawing a project from basically nothing to something that we're looking at sort of six to eight million quids worth of work it's a stunning piece of vision and work that's gone on so far to have bought the hall stabilized the hall purchased the land for the road and and the fact we're even embarking on this journey i think is absolutely testament to the effort that's gone on so far uh, there's a further question this is from glenn mackie oh sorry andrew no it's okay i was just agreeing with with neil okay uh further question 
Sorry, I have a very slow connection out here. Um, further question from Glenn Mackey. Does the land that you own have access to the waterfront? And do you have any interior photos of the upper floor? So, no, we don't have access to the waterfront. That's not part of the land. Pr principally, the land that we own was shown in that uh, plan that Sandra showed that, sh that shows the car park. Um, so, no, we don't have access. It's pretty much the red or the blue dotted line around the outside is our land ownership. Um, and I've forgotten the second question. I, mean, I probably wasn't best place to take that one. What's the second question? Uh, I'll just find it. Um, do you have any interior photos of the upper floor? Not tonight. No. <laughs> no, there are no interior photographs <laughs> or anywhere of the hall. As far as we know. But if you know better, we'd like to hear from you. So if you do rummage in the attic. Well, you know, yeah. If somebody has, that would be great. great. Yeah. The, the, uh, we will say that when John Sanders was up in March, um, he found, a, you know, there didn't seem to be much there, but um, there's just little bits of archive of detail within that principal floor, which can drive uh, quite a considerable sort of reconstruction. And, and that's not us driving that. that, that's coming from, you know, a heritage consultant um, and conservation architect. Um, so they, they are confident that they can uh, produce, uh, I mean, it won't be original detail, but it will be to the same sort of level. Um, but in the first phase, there is there is no real attempt to do that. There will be no real attempt to do that. Uh, in effect, possibly there will probably be bare walls um, showing really how it exists. Um, and and the, 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 the sort of the main feature will be the interpretation and uh, and 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 the uh, AR, the sort of the digital uh, interpretation will help recreate that space uh, for the visitors. I've, okay, and then uh, nearly, are you going to pick up Chris's second question about the sewage treatment and foul drainage? Uh, I certainly will. And uh, see, Chris, you. Uh, you you may have left SEPA, but you just can't get away, can you? I know. Um, just having a flashback so, then, Neil. Sorry. Yeah, it's, fair enough. I used to work, you know, I used to work at the Environment <laughs> Agency doing sewage, so you, you just can't get away from it. Um, yes, so the intention is really to use the soakaway area in the, the car park you'll, um, for the, the outfall. So, yes, we are going to be careful about that. Um, it, it's likely there could be two phases because um, we, we can see what we're we're planning for the first three phases of, of the scheme. But if something bigger did happen and it became more of a function, a venue function, um, then I think we'd exceed the, the sewage capacity. So no, the soakaway area would be um, in that. I have already had a couple of conversations with Tracy about that and about realigning the, um, the Otterburn as well. So we're on it. Thank you. Okay, I think th there aren't really any more specific questions. There's quite a few really interesting comments, including a volunteer by Chris Jesus on hotline plastering lately. So I think we may be making out of that. But um, if it's possible to keep the chat, um, Sandra, I don't know if we could do that. But I think there's quite a lot of good comments there around design okay. um, and so on that would probably be quite useful to keep for the record. So. It's really interesting. I, I think one of the key elements within the design, sorry, I'll go, go back here, is that, um, you know, our access down to the hall will be via this road. Um, but the trustees were very keen that um, the visitors would come round the front of the hall so that they would have sight of the, the main principal entrance, um, which is the view that most people have that in their mind sight when they think about the Hall of Clestron with an entrance down on the left hand side here. Um, and these are the sort of things that, you know, has, has 
taken has evolved over this period of time um, and and uh, it's the sort of thing that you know we really would welcome feedback from you know what people th think about these sort of choices um, so yeah community feedback perfect constructive constructive uh, uh, criticism perfect um, please just uh, let me know um, I, I welcome it There's right. just a, a question just come in from Sally. Uh, just a final question from Sally just coming about any, whether there are any original features left in the hall, such as fireplaces, kitchen ovens, etc. I think that's probably it in terms of uh, time for questions now. I, I can just finish that one off. There's the last vestige of the panelling in the uh, in the north reception room. Um, there's uh, fireplaces and we can deduce from them how they were finished. There's a, there's a, there are a lot of features there. There's skirting boards and there's so much, there's so little left, but there is so much evidence of what was there, including paintwork and colors and all manner of things. So we can have a great record of that building. And just to add to that, Andrew, um, the work that was done with the discovery in the archive was really interesting in as yes. much as it pulled together pretty much the builder's schedule for, for doing the job so we know how many ladders and doors so and, detail. and one point running. in the archaeology i forgot to mention was down um, in front of the drain we found a lot of perfectly preserved wood shavings which shows um, that there was probably a makeover of the hall in about 1850s, and we've got beautifully preserved wood down there. I forgot to mention that, but there we are. We're having lots of evidence. So, I think that very much um, nicely wraps the whole thing up. So, um, I hope everybody's found that a really interesting evening. Um, I, I think it's been excellent to bring the three societies together um, and with people wearing their multiple hats or single hats as you choose. choose. Um, and it, I, I've learned from this this evening, uh, even though I'm sitting on various boards, but that, that's been, I found it very informative and, and very entertaining. Um, I would like to say my sincere thanks to both uh, Sandra um, and Andrew for the, the quality of the presentations. Um, and you really do need a Zoom. Yeah, all right, we'll do that. That, that, that works in Zoom, <laughs> we'll do that. Um, <laughs> um, but also really to say, uh, thanks so much for Julie and, and Haley for the technical work that's gone in the background and the organizational work that went on to put this together and getting Eventbrite sorted out and the uh, the producing the posters and all the other bits and pieces so um, I think it's been an excellent team effort I think it bodes extremely well for when we can actually get together um, and um, I really hope we'll see you at some of the other events that are going to be going on and if somebody wants to arrange something else joint I'm sure others would turn up so um, once again, my sincere thanks to you all for, tur for I say turning out this evening, well, walking across your lounge this evening, you know, if that's as much effort as you put in, well, whatever. Um, but, you know, thanks Rich indeed for bothering to come to this this evening. Um, it's been great to see everybody greatly enthused by the interest shown in, in the project. And, you know, please keep your eyes open and work out what, what we can do. I think Julie's going to post some um, items in the chat, I think, in terms of uh, links for the society. Is that the plan? Um, so if people do want more contact information, um, then uh, that, that'll all be available in the chat. You can pick those links up there. Is there anything else I've forgotten to say, Kaylee? No, I think we're OK. Good. Fantastic. There you go. In that case, wish you all um, a good evening and thanks Rush indeed for coming. Okay. Bye all. Thank you. Thanks, Dale.